We are living in a world of chaos, darkness, arrogance, selfishness, self-deceit. There is joy to be found in your word, in your presence, in your power. There is no joy to be found in this world. We, we are in dangerous times. And the only thing I know to pray for my hope is centered and grounded is come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. But I don't know when you're coming, Lord, and no one else does either. We keep on believing in the Father's heart towards us. We keep on believing in you and your protection, your power over us as your brothers and sisters in the family of faith. We keep looking to you for redemption, deliverance, healing, restoration, whatever we need this morning. For every life in this room, every marriage in this room, every family in this room, every friendship in this room, whatever it is we need, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, feed us at the banquet table of your grace this morning. Nourish our souls. Give us wisdom. Give us insight for life. Give us courage to take a stand when we know what the right thing is. Lead us through your Holy Spirit down a path of righteousness and peace. So many distractions, so many deceptions, so many destructions around us. Keep our feet firmly planted on the path of your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we follow it wholeheartedly. In Jesus' mighty name. Good. Good. That was perfect timing. Thursday, I was, I was looking at one of the reference verses that are in the words of life this week. And um, really, it was just, it was a, a verse that I had remembered and I wanted to uh, pull it in because it, it fit the imagery or the, uh, the imagery actually comes from that verse and from Psalm 103. And I so I was going back to it, this passage in Isaiah, and oftentimes, you know, I'll read one verse or a couple of verses around it, and then I want to go back and read the chapter, and then I want to read the chapter before that, and then the chapter that follows, and, and get the whole context. And so in the midst of that, there's this magnificent section of Scripture. Really what I want you to do, I want you to just to listen to this, and then we'll go to another passage together. But I, I want you just to hear the word of the Lord, and there's a whole, it's an amazing section of Scripture, really, beginning probably in uh, the late 30s of Isaiah or uh, around Isaiah 40, 41, 40. Few. He has a son who is the wickedest king to ever rule. His name is Manasseh. Manasseh is so wicked that during his reign, God takes him away in uh, chains, makes him captive. Ultimately, there's an, it's a phenomenal story. Ultimately, he humbles himself, which he has never done before. He humbles himself, and he, uh, he seeks his God. I mean, the sins that were rampant in his reign uh, range from child sacrifice. Uh, really, that's probably the, the peak right there. His own sons being cast into the fire. I mean, really heinous stuff. And he seeks, his, he seeks his God. He repents. And God actually brings him back and restores him to his throne. He has a son, Ammon, who is pretty wicked, and he doesn't rule very long. Then his son, Josiah, is one of the best kings to ever rule. So it's, in a, it's this totally contradictory thing that you see in the kingdom of God working its way out through human history. Sometimes phenomenal fathers have god-awful children, and sometimes the worst fathers. I mean, Josiah uh, takes, the, takes the throne at six years of age. I mean, who, you know, you're like, whoa, oh, that's scary. Whoa. Sounds like some of our politicians, right? They act about six, right? But their intellectual development's probably stunned at about six, but um, here's Josiah, and he, he's, he's surrounded by, by some faithful men, priests, advisors, and others. And as he, as he grows, he becomes a phenomenal king. And then his sons go haywire. So it's, it's Hezekiah, another generation, another generation, another generation, and then another generation after Josiah. And it's his sons who are ruling one of his sons when Nebuchadnezzar comes calling. When he comes to wield the hand of God's judgment on his own nation. Do you hear that? It's one of Josiah's sons. He gets taken away in captivity in the first deportation. Then he installs uh, his uncle, who's 21 years old, Adoniah. That is Nebuchadnezzar, installs him on the throne, renames him Adekiah, and then he rules for a period of time. And ultimately, he rebels against, against uh, Babylon, and they bring the final hammer down. You have, a couple of, you have a period of about 17 years where all this is taking place, right? From uh, about 597... Uh, well, the, the, the Babylonians are conquering from, you know, about 605 B.C. down to about 586. And they take the first group of captives, um, probably about 597, and then another group. And then ultimately, when they finally come through and sweep through and destroy the nation, it's about 586 B.C. When they conquer, this is, now, 
remember, Isaiah is ministering in the time of Hezekiah. So just go back. Boom, 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 boom. Five generations before this is taking place. And he is predicting and prophesying that this Babylonian captivity is going to take place, where it's going to come from, and also how God is going to ultimately execute judgment on Chaldea, on the Babylonians, for the way that they have treated his people. I gave them into your hand, but then you overdid it. Isn't that the, isn't that the way it always works? Somebody gets power, somebody has the weaponry, somebody has the whatever, and they, they go overboard, right? Well, I want you to hear this, just to, to listen to this. This is the end of uh, Isaiah 42. He's addressing the people, and then I want you to see what, what, he, what he continues with in Isaiah 43. He says, Hear, you deaf, look, you blind, and see. Who is blind but my servant, and deaf like the messenger that I send? Who is blind like the one committed to me, blind like the servant of the Lord? You have seen many things, but have paid no attention. Your ears are open, but you hear nothing. It please the Lord for the sake of his righteousness to make his law great and glorious. But this people, this is a people plundered and looted, first by the Assyrians in the northern kingdom, then by the Chaldeans, all of them trapped in pits or hidden away in prisons. They have become plunder with no one to rescue them. They have been made loot with no one to say, send them back. Which of you will listen to this or pay close attention in time to come? Good question, isn't it? Which of you will listen to this? Who handed Jacob over to become loot and Israel to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned? They would not follow his ways. They did not obey his law. So he poured out on them his burning anger, the violence of war. It enveloped them in flames, yet they did not understand. It consumed them, but they did not take it to heart. Now, this is chapter 43, but now, this is what the Lord says. This is a beautiful section of Scripture, so I want you to do something here. I'm going to read this because it says, it says, O Jacob and O Israel. But when I read it, I want you to hear, O Michael, O Beth, O Yasmin, O Cheryl. I want you to hear the Lord speak this word to your heart. Now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Lynn, he who formed you, O Don, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead, since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you. I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, called by my name. Followers of Jesus, Christians, Christianos, follower of Christ, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. You are my witnesses. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I and not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians in the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. Noticing a theme here about who is God and who is not? Yet you have not called on me, Jacob. You have not called upon me, O Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves for me, O Israel. You have not brought me sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with your sacrifices. Now, the sacrifices, the temple was open. The sacrifices were going on. But what do you think he's saying? They're bringing them, but their hearts are far from him. Are you following that? You have not wearied yourselves for me. Well, I thought, I thought God did everything, and we didn't do anything. But we don't in our salvation, but in our lives, our spirituality, our walk. No passion, no effort, no energy, no nothing. The disease that has infected the West today when it comes to our faith is apathy, indifference, arrogance, laziness. This is the disease that will kill us eventually here in the West. We are too comfortable for our own sake. 
That's the reality of it. That's the reality of Christianity in the Western world. Someone uh, uh, from a third world said to a pastor here in the United States, your wealth, your wealth, your luxury, your comfort has, has allowed you to buy distance from one another. When talking about the church and talking about relationships and talking about the kind of community that is envisioned in the New Testament, this person said, your wealth has allowed you to buy distance from each other. Are you hearing that? Do you understand what he's saying? You don't understand that. It means we can come together one time a week and we can sit in here with our, with our polished clothes on and our nice attitudes and we can walk out of here, never see, talk to, or pray about again for the rest of the week and call it church and call it community. Because we have the money to allow us to go back to our homes, shut those garages and doors down, and lock the rest of the world out. Does that make sense now? Your wealth has allowed you to buy distance from one another. But in fact, the whole New Testament, the whole, the whole of... Uh, Myriad of commands in the New Testament. The majority are y'alls. Second person plural, right? You all. Or love one another, forgive one another, bear one another's burdens. That's impossible if there is no, what? No other. <laughs> There's no, that's not possible to do just on your own by yourself somewhere. You can't bear someone else's burdens if you don't have connection with them, relationship with them. So, I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor wearied you with demands for incense. You have not bought any fragrant calamus for me, or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices. You have burdened me with your sins, and wearied me with your offenses. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. It's a beautiful picture there. And then he says, and remembers your sins no more. Two phenomenal pictures there. Blots out is really probably not an accurate translation because on the scrolls in the ancient world, if you wanted to write over something, you had to, you had to wipe it clean in order to rewrite something on it, on one of the scrolls. It literally means to wipe out. I have wiped the record of your sins from the scroll of my remembrance clean, and I will remember them no more. Not only that, I've taken them and cast them into the sea of divine forgetfulness. You know what this is? This is grace even in the midst of judgment. This is grace. Review the past for me. Let us argue the matter together. State the case for your innocence. Your first father sinned. Your spokesman rebelled against me. So I will disgrace the dignitaries of your temple. And I will consign Jacob to destruction and Israel to scorn. Now he goes on in chapter 44 to, uh, that's the beauty of the prophets, just like in the Psalms. Even after judgment is declared, there is the opportunity to return to the Lord and to receive nothing but grace and mercy from his hand. Now, you know the history. I just shared with you a few minutes ago what happens in 586. So did they turn to the Lord and receive from him these things, or did they not? They did not. And what was true for them will be true for us. And will probably be true for us as a nation, because as go, as go the children of God, so goes the United States of America, or any other nation for that matter. Our wealth, our comfort, our luxury has allow, allowed us to buy a whole lot of things that are not real healthy for us, not just distance from each other, but distance from God as well. We've just reached a stage in history where we simply don't care anymore. And here's the danger of it. We don't care that we don't care. That's even more dangerous. I was talking to someone this past week, and, and, and you know, I know the, I know the, the relationship, uh, the marital relationship in this particular situation pretty well. And I said to the person, you know, you don't care this particular attitude that was being expressed toward their spouse, you don't care. And what's worse is you don't care that you don't care. That's even worse. That's what I'm talking about here. We don't care that we don't care as far as God is concerned. That's the most dangerous thing right there that you can imagine. Now, I want to take you to 1 Corinthians 15. So shift gears, and you'll see where we're going. I think that this passage that I just read will make a whole lot of sense when we get to... Uh, when we wrap this up today. 1 Corinthians 15. So we finished our series on, uh, on forgiveness last week by looking at 1 Corinthians 13. The fact that love is a horrible bookkeeper, right? Because he keeps no record of wrongs, no account of the things that others have done against us. Love is a horrible bookkeeper. Don't hire love to do your taxes. Take a minute to set, settle in there. You'll get it. 1 Corinthians 15. Now listen, this, this entire chapter has one aim and one goal, and that is the reality of the resurrection of the Son of God. whole chapter has one theme, one goal. Corinthians, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Your faith in him is based on that resurrection from the dead. 
Without it, your faith is in vain. It's futile. It is useless. If Jesus didn't rise from the grave, not only do you not have life coming in the future, you, not only do you, do you not have any hope for a life beyond the walls of this world, but your faith now, it's futile, it's useless, it's in vain. There is no hope if Jesus did not rise from the grave. That's the entire message and the beauty of it. When he gets down to the bottom, he begins to explain some things about what kind of body we will, we will dwell in for eternity. The perishable will put on the imperishable. The mortal will put on immortality, and death will be swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, right? And uh, sin comes from the knowledge of the law. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he wraps up that whole thing on a, on a note of victory and then challenges us to live that way and to bring the kingdom of God to bear on the lives around us. I want you to notice how it begins, and this is important as a reinforcement. What is, in fact, the earliest message of the earliest church? This is how that band of brothers known as the body of Christ, all the way back there in the apostolic age, chose to reveal the consuming fire of God's incarnate love to a lost and dying and desperate world. This is the earliest incarnation of the message. Now listen, of a formalized creed which could be passed on, something that could be passed on from follower to follower, worshiper to worshiper, shepherd to sheep, and soul after soul after soul. I call this the agreed upon gospel. This is, this is the earliest message of the earliest church. In verse 1, Paul writes, is that on? In verse 1, Paul writes, now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel, the gloriously good news, the gospel I preach to you, which you received. And how did they receive it? How did they receive the gospel? By faith. Exactly the same manner that you and I did. In faith, from their own will, at a point in time, and coterminous with his preaching of it. That's how they received it. From their own will, at a point in time, coterminous with Paul's preaching of the gospel, that gospel you received and on which you have taken your stand. That is, uh, just to give you a, a little technical point here, the perfect active indicative. If you... If you were to look at a, put this on your piece of paper or, or see this on a graph, you would see a, a point finished and then a line out beside it. The action is complete and the results of that action continue. That's perfect tense. Active voice, if you know any grammar at all, means that the subject is the one performing the action. You've taken, you have personally taken your stand on the gospel. You received it. You took your stand on it. The indicative mood is the mood of reality. It means you've taken your stand presently and permanently on the gospel. That's the idea of the perfect active indicative. Now, here's a tiny bit of insight into what it means to receive something from God. You received, you received is from para lombano. Para lombano. P-A-R-A-L-A-M-B-A-N-O. P-A-R-A-L-A-M-B-A-N-O. And paralambano means to receive to yourself what is communicated by another. So very simply, right? To receive to yourself what is communicated by another. It also means to accept what has been established. So something has been previously established. Mm, let's say 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? That's been an established fact. A fact of mathematics throughout human history. All right, something's been established, you accept that. If you don't accept that in first grade, you're probably not going very far. Do you agree with that? Okay, so something's been established and you accept it. Martin Gingrich, Greek English lexicon, states that paralambano can be used of a spiritual heritage and that the emphasis lies not so much on receiving and taking over. The emphasis is not so much on receiving and taking over, though that element is there. It is more on agreement and approval. Agreement and approval. Let me give you the, the Reverend Rick expanded translation here. Which you receive to yourselves by accepting with approval. The gospel that you received to yourselves by accepting with approval. The only kind of approval that counts with God is the approval of faith. It's our acknowledgement of the faithfulness and unchangeability of Abba. That his heart is true. It's for us, not against us. He has only our best in mind and this aspect of his essence is unchanging. The only kind of approval that counts with God is the approval of faith. Hearing with faith is how we receive. I'd get that down if you're jotting notes. Hearing, to hear and do nothing is to be a hearer of the word only. And we all know, we all saw that passage in James chapter 1, verses 23 through 25. To hear with the ear. You have this concept in the New Testament, and I love it because it's an amplified form of 
There, there's, a, there's a root verb, akuo, in the Greek, meaning to hear. Right? You've heard something, you acknowledge it, eh, that's about the end of it. You hear it. But there is a compound of that, hupakuo, right, in intensified form. It means to hear with the ear, right, to understand or to comprehend with the, with the, the mind and ultimately the heart, to obey with the will. That's what it means to be a, a, a doer of the word. Our faith processes this information and translates it into action. And it, it, it literally, and you know this experientially, and I know it experientially, it literally will not happen if we don't believe it. If we merely understand it and say, well, that, that uh, okay, well, that sounds about right. That sounds, that sounds pretty good. But if we don't take it as a message for me personally that God is speaking to me, I mean, when you're sitting here, oftentimes you're thinking, man, I know, I know some people really need to hear this. I mean, it's natural. Man, oh, gosh, I wish, you know. And a lot of times it's like, I wish my husband was here. I wish my wife was here. I wish, I wish my kids were here. You know, huh? all that kind of stuff. Well, it's probably right. They probably need to hear it. No doubt about it. But guess what? They're not here. And you are. And that's no accident. Are you with me? That's no accident. So God is speaking through his spirit to each one of us. Anytime we gather and look into his word. And he could speak to those other people if they were present, but they're not. So there's not a whole lot we can do worrying about that. There's, not, there's nothing really we can do to affect that. So let's just go, okay, this is my opportunity to learn from the Father. There is a simple prayer that I promise you. This is the one I can tell you, Jeremy. God will answer every time without doubt. Father, teach me right here, right now, right where I am. That kind of humility doesn't have to be in a worship setting, wherever you are, driving to work, whatever you're doing, Father, teach me this day. Show me what you want me to learn. Open up a door of opportunity with the people around me. Give me a chance to encourage them, to challenge them, to speak your word or your gospel or whatever it is you've laid upon my heart into their lives. Those are the kind of prayers that God will answer, boom, every time. But especially, Father, teach me right here, right now. That kind of humility God loves because he has promised in his word to fill the hungry with good things. You hear that? He's not talking about cupcakes, right? With icing three inches high. As good as that might be, he's not talking about that. He will fill those who are spiritually hungry after him with good things. He offers us the bread of life. Listen, this is, how close is it to you? You got one of these in your house anywhere? Anywhere. Anywhere? It's that close. See the, see the difference between that and that, that, and that, that's the difference. When it's closed, doesn't help. When it's open and our hearts are open, we have, uh, we have the means through which we can receive. So to hear with the ear, to believe with the heart, to obey with the will, that is to be a doer. Now you know, and you're the only one who can know, when you're receiving the word with faith as the instruction of God, or when you're giving it the nominal attention afforded to something that somebody, something somebody you may or may not trust stood up and taught you. There is so much, and believe me, I get it. I get it. There is so much distrust of people towards churches, towards pastors, towards spiritual leaders, toward whatever. And listen, if all I knew about, uh, about a, being a follower of Jesus or this thing called Christianity or this ancient faith or whatever I wanted to call it, if all I knew about it was what I saw on TV, I can tell you personally, even as a pastor, I would want no part of it. I would say, no way, man. You're telling me if I send you a certain amount of money, it's going to come back to me 30, 60, or 100 fold? Why don't you send me the 100 fold first and I'll give you 30 back? How about that? Why don't we just turn it around? You send me 100 bucks, I'll send you 30 back. Then you can plant that seed and get 300 from it. How about that? That's, that's how my mind works. Why don't we do it this way first? And then, I mean, you've got greater faith than I do. I mean, you're on TV, you got a million, you know, quad million dollar, you know, ministry, right? So let's, let's do it that way. You send me the money, I'll give you some back, and you can plant that. How about that? If it works, it should work great for you. You're the one teaching it. Y'all like that? Yeah. Well, let's do it. Let's call, let's call the next uh, televangelist and say, hey, man, I got a plan. I plan we can all benefit from. No, I mean, that, that kind of, the, the, just the, the idiocy and the fact that so much, so much of our faith is so, in the West especially, uh, has become so intertwined with the political parties. That's a dangerous, dangerous game. Being a Republican is not the same as being a follower of Jesus. Being a Democrat, not the same as being a follower of Jesus. There, there, are, there are elements probably from both sides of the political equation. By the way, there's not just two options to any, anything in life. You know, there's not just this or that or you know, the either or. A lot of times there's a both and. There are elements of both of those that are probably uh, 
compatible with Scripture, and there are a whole lot in both of those viewpoints that are totally incompatible with the Word of God. And the sooner that we come to just acknowledge that, the better off we're going to be. It's, um, it's amazing how people get so centered on this kind of stuff. I have some close friends, close friends, that really just kind of left my ministry behind because when I talk about a political philosophy, I talk about freedom as the main issue because our God is a God of freedom. He gave us the ability to accept him or reject him, to walk with him or to turn away from him. Because I, I'm not a rabid Republican, that, that, and because I say things like, listen, the Republican is not righteous and Democrat is not righteous, and make statements like that, that was offensive. That was offensive. That was, I'm unable to hear that. Don't tell me that. Don't tell me that. If your faith is that intertwined with either party, you've been deceived. You have been deceived, my friend. I don't care who you are or where you are. If you think that equates to walking with God, you have been deceived. Now, listen, there's so much mistrust towards spiritual leaders and other people, and I get that. I understand that, especially if you had come out of, a, if you'd come out of Catholicism in the early and mid parts of the 20th century. Boy, you, you know, I understand it completely. All of, the, all of the, the child abuse and the sexual abuse and things that went on. So I get all of that. But only you know whether when you hear the word, whether you're giving it, you are, you are receiving it with faith as the instruction of the Almighty. Or when you're just giving it a little bit of nominal attention. Eh, it sounds like something that somebody whom I may or may not trust stood up and taught me. I'm not saying put your faith in me. Faith as faith in <clears throat> But I will say this, you have no reason not to trust me when it comes to the Word of God. Over the years, my integrity with regards to the Word has been well established. This is what I love, this is what I do, this is what I'm dedicated to. I am by no means infallible in my interpretation of Scripture. That's not the point. But I want to know the Word, <clears throat> I want to know God's will, I want to see His kingdom come in every life and every circumstance of our lives, and uh, I want the best for all of us. Whatever that takes to get there, whatever that takes. There's no, there's no, I mean, obviously, we're not consumed with money and buildings and all that kind of stuff. That's not the focus of our, right, of our ministry. So I'm simply saying in regards to the point that I just made, there's no reason not to come in here with a humble attitude and say, Father, teach me. If I did nothing but read that section of Scripture that we started with, if we just read that and we received it in faith, that'd be a great start. There's the Word of God. Here's God speaking to me. Boom right? The only way we're going to be transformed from within is when we accept the word by faith, embrace it in the depths of our hearts as meant for me personally, for me. Be great if all those people that, it, that we know need to hear this were here, but they're not. So that means that God is speaking to me and to you. We give the Holy Spirit unhindered access to these very places. We allow him to wield the sword of the word. It is his sword, is it not? According to Ephesians 6, the sword of the Spirit He's the word of God, the word put into practice, the word in action. Welcome him, in fact. Seek his presence. Seek his purity and his healing power in those most broken and damaged and traumatized regions of the subconscious soul. That's how we are transformed. By asking God into these places and asking him to wield the sword of his word there, to wield his comfort, his love, his mercy, his grace, the healing balm of his word. Don't go there. That's our cultural axiom, right? We must go there. There's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere else to go. Paul says in verse 2, by this same gospel, the same gospel that you received for yourselves by accepting with approval and on which you have taken your stand presently and permanently, by this same gospel you are saved. That's a present, present passive indicative, present tense. You are being saved, being delivered, being redeemed by this same God who gave you this same gospel, and it is in process your salvation is in process and on into eternity. It won't be finished until we stand in the presence of Jesus Christ. I mean, we'll have our resurrection body that 1 Corinthians speaks of, 1 Corinthians 15 speaks of. We'll have that when we finally stand in the presence of Jesus. But listen, I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to be done even then. You think the riches of God are going to be exhausted no matter how long? I mean, eternity is beyond time. So after a million years, you've just gotten started, if there are even years to count. So there's all, this, there's, there's all this time, but God is infinite. And we get, a, we, get a, we get a taste. We get a glimpse now. No matter how far you peer into the wisdom of the word, you get just a glimpse of the goodness and the graciousness of God in time. There is a whole universe that God has waiting of treasures concerning himself in store for those who love him. So there we are in eternity. 
in our resurrection bodies, we're in our final form, right? The same, uh, we got this Jesus suit that we're wearing, right? And then, we're, and then we're able to do all kinds of things. But there we are, there we are in God's presence, and we're, we're learning new things, seeing new things about him. So isn't that further redemption, further restoration, further growth? You say, well, we're, well, we're there and we're finished. Everything's good. But we're learning and we're experiencing, experiencing personally, emotionally, more and more of God every thousand years, million years, 10 million, whatever it is, every moment. I don't know. Doesn't that sound like growth to you? Sounds like growth to me. That we're going to continue. I mean, if you want to use evolution in a good sense, we're going to continue to evolve spiritually because we're going to receive more and more of God. Now, this is sanctified imagination, but it's completely consistent with the Word of God. I'm not saying we're going to turn to something different, that kind of evolution. I mean, we're going to become more and more of what he intended us to be. The man or woman that you always dreamed you could be, the man or woman you were created to be, you will be, and you will be perfectly in eternity. And that's a pretty, pretty powerful thing. When you look at your own life and you look at the, the, the infinite number of failures when it comes to sin, arrogance, criminality, whatever your, little, whatever your area of weakness is, man, you're like, wow, mm, that's going to be pretty good. Not quite reached my potential just yet. Kind of hit my ceiling, you know? Well, no ceilings in eternity. By the same gospel, you are being saved, delivered, redeemed, on into eternity. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, that sounds like, well, maybe you will and maybe you won't. But here's the thing. Remember all those, remember those conditions that we saw in 1 John? Remember the third class condition? That's the maybe one? Well, this is not that. This is what's called a first class condition in the Greek language. And the first class condition is a statement of fact. It's not if you hold firmly. I absolutely, I think that's a, a poor translation. It is since you hold firmly. Now listen to that. There's a huge difference. You're being saved, delivered, redeemed since you hold firmly and you do hold firmly to it. Otherwise, apart from the good news of grace, the good news of grace which glories in the resurrection of Jesus. Remember the context. The whole chapter has one theme, the reality of Jesus' resurrection from the grave. That's the sole theme of this entire chapter. Otherwise, apart from the, the good news of grace which glories in the resurrection of Jesus, you have believed <clears throat> in vain, meaning to no avail, to no purpose, without effect. Now in verses 1 and 2, the apostle's using a, uh, a rhetorical technique which came down from the schools in ancient Greece. He's laying out his argument from an agreed-upon premise. I just want you to pay attention. That's kind of a you're like, well, we're, now we're talking about rhetoric, and we talked about the Greek language. Just follow me, track with me for a moment. He's laying out an argument from an agreed-upon premise, okay? In other words, two people are, are uh, debating, and they both agree that this is the reality. Now we're going to debate from that position. It's a rhetorical technique. For example, I'll give you an example. If I were to say men and women have distinctly different ways of looking at the world, okay? You agree with that? Men and women have distinctly different ways of relating to each other. Men and women have distinctly different ways of processing their experiences. Might be the understatement of the millennium, right? Right? Do you agree with this? Okay. If so, then we have a foundation from which to build on. You tracking? We have an agreed upon premise. You with me? Okay. We have an agreed upon premise. That's what Paul's doing with the disciples in Corinth. He's forcing them to agree. Yeah, you know, you're right. This is the very gospel by which we were saved from the darkness of sin and death. We agree, Paul. That's right. <clears throat> and the heart of this gospel, as we'll see in the next five verses, which he's building to, is the resurrection of Jesus in real time and real space, a historical reality. Now, here's the point I want to make and sort of wrap everything up with. We're not close to being uh, finished just yet, but this is, the, this is where we're headed. This got me thinking Looking at this section of Scripture got me thinking about the idea of an agreed-upon premise, okay? Just like that. Like, men and women have distinctly different ways of relating to each other, of looking at the world, of processing their experiences. <clears throat> and I got to thinking about an agreed-upon premise, whether that was in conversation. Sometimes you talk to people, and you think you're talking about the same thing. And you realize, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes in, either this person is dumber than dirt, they have no idea what we're talking about, or they have a totally different belief system concerning this concept. What, I mean, there's one of a couple of different options, but we are not talking about the same thing. We're using the same language. We are not talking about the same thing. 
And that's okay. We're not, I'm just saying, that's, that's the way the world works, right? But we thought we were, you know, common ground, and we're like, that's eh, not exactly, I don't think that's exactly accurate, you know? So whether it's in conversation, whether it's in problem-solving, Betty, relationships, an agreed-upon premise, anywhere and everywhere. It's got me thinking about this idea, and something stuck out about it. I couldn't get it out of my head. So I ask Abba, what, what are you saying to me through this? What can we as a community of your children learn from this in the here and now that might benefit us in the moment? And this is what came to me. Here's the setup. Each one of us faces a mighty foe in a mighty conflict, often for several rounds in the course of a given day, okay? We live in a world at war. I don't think there's really any debate about that spiritually between, between God and evil. Each one of us individually faces a mighty foe in a mighty conflict, often for several rounds, right? One through 12. You're hoping it's over after three, but it goes on to 10, 12, and then 15 until one of you decides to toss in the towel. Several rounds in the course of a given day. And we know, we personally know dozens of people, hundreds even, reeling from the blows they've taken who've had whatever solid ground they once stood on snatched out from under them. They are wounded warriors in an immensely wounded world. I'm talking about other sons and daughters of God. Maybe your friends, maybe your family, maybe people that you're familiar with. They are immensely wounded warriors in an immensely wounded world. Thus we see uh, Philo of Alexandria's exhortation to be kind, for everyone you know is facing a great battle. The Corinthians were in that same beleaguered boat. Okay, They were in that same boat. Or listen, do you, think that, uh, do you think the world around them, the sin within them, and the devil opposing them were any different in the days of Rome than they are in the Western world of the 21st century? Think about the Corinthians. Do you think the world around them, now Corinth is like Las Vegas, Tokyo, and New York at midnight, all wrapped up into one. I've seen some, I've seen some modern uh, commentators say, well, I don't really think, I don't think Corinth was any different from any other. Yeah, Corinth was a lot different. There was sin everywhere, but Corinth... Uh, at the Acropolis, on the hill of the Acropolis, Corinth had a temple to Aphrodite, who's the goddess of love and sexuality. And there were a thousand cult prostitutes, a thousand priestesses. What they were is cult prostitutes. And they would come down the hill into the streets of the city every night to ply their trade. Now we're talking, we're not talking about a mass, we're not talking about a city the size of Little Rock. We're talking about one of the cities of the ancient world, right? Much smaller in number. And yet here are all these cult prostitutes in the streets. People came from all over the ancient world with pockets full of money. There was an ancient uh, kind of proverb, not every man can afford a trip to Corinth, right? It's expensive in a whole lot of ways. You following? You tracking with that? Don't get distracted. Stay with me. All right. The world around them, no different. The sin within them, you think the sin nature in the Corinthians is any different in the days of Rome than it is today? No. The devil who was opposing them, you think he was any different in the days of Rome than he is, than the demonic realm is today in the Western world of the 21st century. No naivete, right? We face a foe who attacks us from three different directions, often simultaneously. I want you to get this. An external enemy, an internal enemy, and a spiritual enemy. An external enemy, an internal enemy, and a spiritual enemy. We face a foe who attacks us from three different directions and often simultaneously. You ever felt like you were just under the gun, completely outnumbered, and, and at the moment, getting the you-know-what kicked out of you. you. You were getting hammered from outside. Your own sin nature is raging. Your thoughts are racing. Everything's going, seems to be going <coughs> wrong, and it's coming from every direction. One, externally, we have the distractions, deceptions, and destructions of the matrix, right? The world around us. I use the matrix because if you've seen that movie or that trilogy, the matrix is a computer-generated reality. It's a false reality. That is the world. I don't, I, don't have a better, I don't have a better metaphor or picture to use. That is the world. All of the, the priorities of the cosmic system, political, monetary, you know, consumerist, all the rest of this stuff, that is the matrix. That's the matrix. We face the distractions, deceptions, and destructions of the matrix internally. Secondly, we face a sinful nature waging war against the Spirit of God. That's Galatians 5 waging war against the Spirit. For those who have come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, believe that He is who He said He was, and that is the Son of God, and the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world, and that He did what He said He would do, and that is pay the price for the sins of the world, accomplished that on His cross, rose from the grave, and ascended to the Father's right hand, 
for those of us who have a relationship with God through faith in that message, in that historical reality, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us, the deepest part of us, and that is the human heart. By the human heart, I mean the soul, the real you, not, not merely the emotions. The Spirit of God dwells in our hearts. It's taking up residence there. And there is a battle that rages inside of us. Anybody know this battle? Between the sinful nature and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to lead us down a path of righteousness and peace, of goodness and grace, mercy, strength, honor, integrity, etc. And the sinful nature wants all the things that are not that, anything but that. So there's this, I mean, Paul explains it like, no matter what, what direction you go, you cannot do the things that you want to do. If you follow the Holy Spirit, the sin nature is fighting. If you follow the sinful nature, the Holy Spirit is fighting. So regardless, right, there's this battle raging. Third, spiritually, there is a devil out to deceive us. I mean, you really believe in a devil? Hmm, yeah. Yeah, I do. You really believe in some kind of demonic realm out there? I mean, we can't see these demons. Oh, really? You read the newspaper lately? Read any headlines? Ever heard of something called ISIS? What do you think motivates them? To kill and to rape and to kidnap and to pillage in the name of their God. It's called the religious spirit. It's a religion at its finest. That's religion, not spirituality, not relationship with the one true God. That is religion. That is a deception. You think that's an accident? That comes straight from the pit of hell. I said it, and you can, you can go to the bank on it, and you can quote me on it, and you can take this tape and give it to any Muslim you want. That is straight from the pit of hell. One religion says, kill, kill, kill in the name of your God. Our God said, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. You see any difference there? There is a devil out to deceive us, the thief who comes to steal our joy, kill our hearts, and destroy our lives. That's John 10.10. If we want to help the hurting hearts around us, if we long to be a source of strength and courage and compassion, then we need to take a cue from Paul in these first two verses of 1 Corinthians 15. Here it is. The Corinthians had a problem. Paul wanted to help solve it. Right now in this section of Scripture, their problem resolves around their inability to come to grips with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not uncommon, would not have been uncommon for Greeks with their philosophy. Remember when we talked about Gnosticism and the basic idea being that matter, right? Wood, stone, earth, flesh, blood, matter is evil and only spirit and soul is good. To the Corinthians, the idea of being in a body forever would have been hateful and heinous. You following that? They would have thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to be imprisoned in this. To them, to die was to be set free. So I don't want another, right? I don't want another, you know, I don't want another body of any kind. I want to be set free. But Paul's saying, listen, you don't understand the nature of this. It's not the same kind of flesh and blood. It is a vehicle motivated and animated by the Spirit of God. That's when you get down farther in 1 Corinthians 15, you have this term, pneumaticos, pneumaticos. And that suffix, Ecos means something is energized, empowered, and enabled. It is motivated and animated by this. By what? By the Spirit. Right now, we're moved and motivated by our souls. We are sukikos. And sometimes, sometimes our souls and what we want is in diametrically opposed to what God wants. But one day, we will be moved and animated, motivated and energized by the Spirit of the living God completely and totally. Body, soul, and spirit. No conflict between uh, what God desires for us, and what we desire for ourselves. So the Corinthians, they had a problem. Paul wanted to help solve it. The Corinthians' problem was a matter of misperception, and not just a misperception, but an outright falsehood concerning the reality of their own resurrection. Until they were willing to relinquish that falsehood and embrace the reality God offered, their problem wasn't going away, was it? Now listen to what I just said. Until they were willing to relinquish that falsehood, and embrace the reality that God offered, their problem wasn't going away. In other words, until they were willing to walk in truth, truth and transparency are flip sides of the same coin, by the way. Truth and transparency. You need and you need desperately someone that you trust, whether it is your spouse, a counselor, a pastor, a close friend, you need somebody to whom you can bear the deepest secrets of your soul. Transparency is a powerful thing, a powerful part of living honestly and openly. We, it, it's, God is certainly always there as, uh, as the counselor. In fact, the Holy Spirit's called the counselor in Scripture, the encourager, the comforter. But it's important for you, as every 12-step program will tell you, in the course of being emotionally healthy, to be able to admit to God, to another, and to myself the true nature of my addiction, which is just another way of saying idolatry. You hearing that? Not just another way of saying idolatry. 
You need a friend. You need somebody to whom you can bear your soul. And if you're sitting here now going, that's stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. That is arrogance talking. That's arrogance talking. Just check that attitude a little bit and say, okay, God, maybe I do. I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to, I'm willing to, uh, to learn if necessary. Until they were willing to walk in truth, truth and transparency, in ruthless honesty over the crisis at hand and its ultimate solution. They were going round and round and round to quote a poet from my childhood, Dancing with Themselves, a poet by the name of Billy Idol. Paul could have written a hundred more letters covering the same solid ground, guess what, to no avail, to no avail. He had to start with the facts. He had to start with a version of reality which begins and ends in the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of our culture or the empire of our education, or the sovereignty of our social status, or the monarchy of modernity. Not the idol of self-exaltation, nor the god of self-gratification. Not anywhere other than in Jesus the Messiah. Are you with me here? Picking up what I'm laying down? As long as we seek to rescue and redeem, as long as those we seek to rescue and redeem refuse to acknowledge the facts in front of them, as long as those we seek to rescue and redeem refuse to acknowledge the facts in front of them, some of which may be brutally painful to accept, like the possibility that I have taken over for Satan as my own worst enemy. Sometimes it happens. We become our own worst enemy. I know we, we, we felt like that whether we wanted to admit it or not at times. Or the reality that, I think about this, this, is, this, this, this kind of stuff stings, but the reality that few people genuinely liking or even respecting me as a human being has to do with my own internal issues and not the others that I so love to point my fingers at. Ooh, if that, if that has any truth to it, that can sting. Until they are willing to accept the facts of reality, they will never find the healing and wholeness promised to them by a faithful father. I'm going to pause. Marshall, when you go ahead and take the lights, I'm going to pause for a second to give you the last point until we get settled in because... By the way, this is, this is the structure that we have. This is the way that we are approaching worship on Sunday mornings and we're finishing with our music. Our kids are, uh, are coming out at 1130 and they're going to be doing that every week. So we'll just we'll get in this process and we'll get used to it and it, it won't be, be like, okay, there it is, 1130. Boom, 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 boom. This is what we do. Is this the way that as we're wrapping this up, is what I'm talking about, okay, building from an agreed upon premise, walking in truth, rejecting the falsehood so that I can embrace the facts of reality. Is that, is that making sense? You getting where I'm going with this? Okay. Until we face facts and embrace truth, until we're willing to walk in humility and reorient ourselves to reality, there will be no restoration for our souls and no redemption for our lives. Now, I'm approaching this from the vantage point of, of you and I wanting to... Uh, wanting to challenge and encourage and nourish the lives of others around us. I'm approaching this as those you want to be um, used as an instrument of redemption and restoration in the lives of other people. But this is powerfully true for each and every one of us as well. Until we, until we face facts, the reality of our situation and why it is what it is, and embrace truth right, as the solution. Until we face facts and embrace truth, until we're willing to walk in humility. What was the problem back there in Isaiah, what was the problem? Idol worship, arrogance, people cutting down trees, building a fire to cook some bread over, taking part of it, shaping it into an idol and getting it, taking it to a silversmith to get it covered in silver or gold, making sure it was balanced just right so that it could stand up, a piece of wood that can't stand on its own, and bowing down before it and saying, you are my God. Darren, people are bowing down before a block of wood. You are my God. Deliver me. Save me. Make me whole. We say, well, that's, ah, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Yeah. That's crazy, is it? How many things do we bow down before and say, you are my God, save me, deliver me? We do it with other people. I mean, classic alcohol, drugs, all that, you know, sex, all that kind of stuff, but we, we do it with money. In the West, our luxury has allowed us to buy distance from one another and distance from God. We do it with money and jobs and, you know, an inheritance is coming, you know, and whatever. Don't spend too much on your health care, mom and dad, because I need some of that bank. Until we face facts and embrace truth, until we're willing to walk in humility, not the arrogance and the idol worship, but humble ourselves before our God and seek him and reorient ourselves to reality, there will be no restoration for our souls and no redemption for our lives. Amen. Let me bless you. And then, uh, Gary, if you'll come, if you want to get your men moving this direction, we'll take up our offering while the band gets in place and uh, go from there. May the Lord bless you 
and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Abba, we are blessed beyond blessed. Regardless of whether there is a spirit of focus or lack of focus or whatever may have gone on here this morning, you've shown us something about the nature of reality, about the power and the grace and the truth that you will pour into the lives of the humble, how you will fill the hungry with good things, send the rich away, the arrogant, those who, who see no need for your word or your will, your grace or your glory, you will send them away empty-handed. My prayer is that no soul leave this place today empty-handed. There is an abundance for us to receive by faith into ourselves. If we will ask the Spirit of God now in this moment to take the things that we have trusted, the things that we've heard and believed, and put them into practice, we can find healing and transformation. Father, move and motivate us to seek more and more of you, to seek your word so that we can know you better, and we can walk in your ways. My prayer is for a a spirit of compassion and generosity to be spread out upon this people and a sense of security that their souls are secure in your love, your hands of protection wrapped around them, your heart of love for them, that they can trust that it's not against them, that you're on their side. Abba, we bless your name, we praise you, and we honor you. Take now our worship in song and our worship in giving and use it to honor and glorify the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen and amen.